Hi, Matthew Holt here with another THCB Spotlight. And uh, this time we're focusing on a company from Europe, which has been around a while. Um, so in your screen here is uh, Peter Oshoshowski. Uh, Peter, I didn't butcher your name too badly, um, who is the CEO of Informatica, which has been one of the leading uh, symptom checker triage chatbot companies in Europe for many years. And most of those companies uh, uh, famously in Europe, not in the US. There are a couple of US companies doing it, but uh, and with him is Tim Price, who is the relatively new uh, chief product officer of that Informatica, who came from another of these chatbot simple companies, bad one. So, Peter, you and I must have met in 2012, 2013, when you were just getting going and you're one of the first VC funded digital health companies in Poland. Um, you've done Health 2.0 Europe a number of times and been in the States. Things have moved on a bit. So, uh, Let's start with today's news. Before today, you'd raised, uh, I think, 12 or $14 million. Um, what, what's your news today? Yeah. Uh, hey, Matt. Thanks for having us again. And just going back to history real quick, uh, you were the first person I met in the US. The very and first. I remember, <laughs> yes, I remember just I went come to the your airport. office. Yeah, to your health 2.0 office. Yep. And you bought me lunch. I remember next to somewhere like Coltrane Station, you remember the place. So Fantastic. I was like, I think, I think that gets you like 5% of the company. So, you know. Exactly. That was like, <laughs> yeah, right. and at that time, I thought it's like Series A in States, but then I found out. Okay. Anyway, uh, great news on our side and super excited to be here today. Uh, so, big news is that we just closed our Series B, uh, which brings $30 million of additional funding. So in total, it's like 44 we got so far. Congratulations. Who led that round? Uh, one peak. Uh, it's a private equity investor from London. A really great crew. Um, also investor in Doc Planner, another European company with Polish roots. So I'm sure you're familiar with them. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's actually, it's interesting. I mean, Europe is taking a little while to catch, to catch up. But I would think that with... You know, a number of the players in Europe, including yourselves and, and, and Babylon and some of the others, there are this sort of focus on uh, symptom checking and, and, and so sort of the conversation between the doctor and the patient and automating that has actually seems to have been bigger in Europe um, uh, than it has been in the US. Although I think uh, a lot of uh, some of the folks, you know, who have European roots like Giant and, 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 and or, or uh, Israeli roots like uh, K Health, or as they call them, K Pop Health, you know, are, are obviously coming to the, to the US. And can you talk a bit about your, we'll, we'll dive into the product in a bit, but can you talk a little bit about your progress from those early days in Poland, you know, in the US and f in the market for similar tracking, where, where you've gone, where did Informatica start and where are you now? Mm -hmm. Sure, Matt. Uh, so it's a long story. We've been on market since 2012. So it's almost 10 years right. since we've been building Informatica. I think we met when we had like 10 people. Right now we have over 180. Uh, so the majority of the team, especially engineering, is based out of Europe, Poland. Uh, but in US, we have our small team, which is obviously growing right now, uh, focused on commercial peace and marketing. Uh, we have around 100 clients. Uh, these are B2B partners like health systems, uh, health insurance companies, uh, telemedicine providers. And what we provide to them is uh, our product, which goes beyond symptom checking. And Tim will tell you a little bit about our platform vision and how we're building on top of this uh, symptom checking and triage capability. Uh, but right now, we helped over 10 million of patients to check their symptoms. We do it in 19 language versions. Uh, we started from Europe, from Poland. So I think it was just necessity for us to expand to other countries like Germany, like adding English, like adding Spanish. I think that worked very, really well for us and allowed us to attract some international partners. So uh, when it comes to international clients, we work with Allianz which is one of the world's largest insurance companies. We work with Cigna uh, International here in Europe. Uh, some more local entities uh, in Europe, uh, which are relevant, but maybe doesn't sound that familiar in the US, like Medish. It's the second largest Portuguese uh, health system and very close partner to us, uh, great cooperation in Germany like Zana Kliniken, which is the largest network of, hospital, uh, of hospitals in Germany. 
Uh, so really clients uh, we're proud of and we're trying to do our best to support them. In US also, we've got uh, some good progress. Now I need to be careful not to reveal anything that's not official yet. So team, if I miss something important, please help me out. But definitely starting with our partnership with Microsoft. I think two years ago, we signed a partnership where we became part of uh, their bot framework. So you can essentially use Informatica's reasoning engine inside of Microsoft product, uh, which is great. Uh, we have a few uh, partnerships with uh, health systems. Uh, here I need to double think which of the, those names I can reveal right now, but we also work with telemedicine vendors. We work with Teladoc uh, and several other great companies. A uh, team, uh, anybody from the US that uh, I think I should mention at this point? You're putting me on the spot when uh, I'll, I'll trust your instincts on it. But um, some, needless to say, some of the, the biggest players, I think like th uh, two or three of the, the biggest um, healthcare providers in the US are, we're, we're working directly with. All right, well, we'll find out more about that, about that later, but let's let's uh, dive in a bit. So symptom checking has been one of these things which people have you know, talked a lot about. There are obviously some, uh, a number of companies on the market doing that. And that, and it's one of these things which is, is uh, uh, but sort of still very much in the early days. I mean, people really are just still with the pandemic getting used to telehealth and live video and, and the concept of talk to a machine, you know, is, is interesting. There have been some specific areas like mental health where, where there are individual companies doing that. But it's still something that's a little bit, I think, unusual, even though we've seen a lot of this sort of stuff at the you know, health to and other conferences over the years. So um, give me a sense, where did you start? And then let's dive into a bit of a demo and see and, and see where, you know, what you've actually been building on. So, uh, so what was the first sort of common framework that you had to build? And then where do you think that's going? Mm -hmm. Sure. So the starting point for our work was the patient component. Right. So our goal right from the beginning was to build this uh, online version of 20 questions, but for symptoms and solving this problem of Dr. Google and having people search through Internet and Googling their symptoms. That was the idea we had back in 2012 when we started the company and it hasn't changed. So this is still what we do. And we see great demand for building patient navigation tools in multiple language versions, given different customizations that are requested by our clients. So guiding patients to the right care and automating this work of, uh, let's say, triage assistant, whether this is call center or this is self-service. So imagine you're going to your patient portal, you can have a chatbot, you can have a more traditional form-based application. Everything we do is, is white labeled extremely customizable. I think this is what makes us unique. And we are also super um, cautious when it comes to our quality and safety. So we do whatever we can to make sure this is safe, accurate, and leading to not overly lengthy interviews. Because if you just have, like, I don't know, you have called, you don't want to answer 60 questions. 10 to 15 is enough. Uh, so that's what we do uh, in two forms, uh, basically. One is API. And I think this is very important, actually, because our products are API first. Uh, we are happy to work under your brand, under your label. If you already have an existing software interface system, we are the easiest way to enhance what you have with triage technology. So this is where we are. And the second one is more of the chatbot interface and form-based interfaces, which are more traditional. So that's what we had so far. But at some point, uh, we figured that this is not enough and we can do more. Uh, and what we want to do is to help automate certain mundane tasks throughout patient journey, from symptoms through intake preparation to following up after visit. And what we really don't like, actually, is like when people say, oh, but you're just another symptom checker. That's something we want to escape from because uh, the capabilities behind our technology and our ambitions, first of all, are much bigger. So what team is going to show you in a second is how we're building on this concept and our platform is now beyond just triage. 
That sounds good. And that sounds like a, an interesting con concept. We'll talk after the demo about, you know, how the sure. patient visit is, is evolving. But Tim, why don't you show us the new product then and uh, tell us what we're about to see? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thanks for that. So I'm going to talk, talk you through our intake product, which is the second module that we're building out as part of our medical guidance platform. Um, so this is built on the same kind of core that the symptom checker and the API uses. Uh, but built out for the, the next step of the journey, which is preparing a patient for that uh, consultation and then being able to hand it over smoothly to a provider and also making the provider's life easier by automating some of the, the visit note generation and some of the other admin that they do. So I'm going to start off with a, a demo of the patient's interview side of things. And for anyone who's seen our, our symptom checker flows, they should recognize some of uh, this. But what I'll show you first of all is there's a, an additional structure that we've put in place here. So up front, we try and work out what the purpose of the visit is. And if it's for checking, uh, if it's for a new concern, new acute condition, then we use the dynamic part of our interview, which is driven by our API and the underlying uh, di diagnostic engine. We also collect some basic information about the patient and then past medical history, which we can then produce into a summary, which is handed over to the provider itself. So in this case, let's go for someone who's presenting with some lower back pain um, and some nausea. So I've got some symptoms to check. I'm going to go for a female patient here, um, 45. First thing we do is uh, check off these risk factors. These risk factors are uh, important because they allow us to tailor the questions that come next. So let's say that she's overweight and a smoker. Um, she might not know about certain things. That's OK. We can skip those. And all of these risk factors are personalized based on the demographics that you get. You then enter the initial symptoms. So again, similar to our, our symptom checker. So in this case, some lower back pain, um, and you can also type as well, uh, nausea. And the more symptoms that we add, the better, because it can skip some of the steps and uh, increase the probabilities uh, within our probabilistic model, which allows us to reach the, the outcome quicker. So I'm gonna skip through these quite quickly, um, but this, these are dynamically generated based on our uh, Bayesian model um, and with the aim of trying to come up with the possible conditions that, the, that this patient might be experiencing. So in this case, some lower back pain uh, that's spreading towards the groin and uh, no pain in the upper back. It's lasted for several hours and it's severe. Um, it started suddenly and it comes and goes. Uh, you'll see that uh, it's not exacerbated by any of these things. Uh, and got some pain between the ribs. So at that point, all of those questions are the dynamically generated section. We're now into the point around collecting the medical history. So here we can find out about previous chronic conditions. So let's say she's unfortunate and she suffers from irritable bowel syndrome. As a result of that, we can add the specialist that she's under the care of. So based on her chronic disease, a gastroenterologist. Um, we can add past hospitalizations that might be relevant. So say so tonsillitis um, and she's had her tonsils removed this year um, and any medications as well so in this case we're uh, showing you the demo version from Poland so integrated with a localized drug database there let's say she's on, on some Senna <laughs> which adds uh, as a result of her, her IBS as well as any allergies or anything else that we want to add final step is to add a, a personalized message so if there's anything that wasn't captured in the interview or if there's anything else uh, that she wants to convey to the provider, we can do this. This is important because um, this is actually the first step we're taking towards uh, some semi-automated uh, consultations. So being able to, to create an asynchronous element to the consultation is, is an important step for us. Finally, she can provide some feedback. Uh, it's obviously great. And uh, once that's been submitted, she can then uh, download her answers as well. So in a second, you'll get the PDF report. This report is very similar to what is presented to the doctor, uh, but she can then take that with her to any other providers, anyone else who's involved in her care as well. Um, if you give me one second, I'm just gonna load up the, the doctor's panel side of things. Um, but if you have any questions in the interim on the, about the patient side, feel free to ask. Yeah, so now so I see that you've, you've added on to the syndrome checking part. We'll dive into that bit a bit, but obviously the, uh, the, the key part is through how this connects with the, the clinician part of it. I assume you can also, with the health system, build in pulling that, pulling their APIs for drugs or other stuff that, you know, may, may Yeah, absolutely. So, so as Kurt said, one of our key 
key kind of strengths, I guess, of the platform and something that we, we live by is to be API first. And that makes it much easier for us when it comes to integrating with EHRs, being able to pull in structured data at the right place at the right time. And those integrations taking kind of a matter of hours rather than weeks and months. So kind of taking the fear out of the EHR integration side of things. Um, okay, so now I'm going to show you the doctor's panel. So this is uh, the iframe uh, version. So obviously, like all of our products can be can fully kind of customized and white labeled. Uh, we're also planning to make this available via API. So it could be integrated directly into the interface of the existing uh, tools or products that the, the provider is using. So you get a simple summary of uh, who the patient is and what they're presenting with. Then on the left hand side, you can see you get the history of the present and absent symptoms, which has been generated based on those, those dynamic uh, questions. And on the right hand side, the basic medical history as well. All of these sections can be toggled on or off, depending on what the provider would prefer to see. And uh, they can either be integrated directly in or we can copy and paste uh, in a structured format out into any other document that's required. Um, all of this is editable. So if we wanted to add in some more details here, um, let's say that the back pain has lasted two days, we can do that, or we can also remove other parts on the way too. Um, and what this contributes to is the assessment of the possible conditions. So in this case, we're seeing uh, not only the potential conditions, but also the ICD-10 codes related to it. And the provider can decide either to select their, uh, to agree with the, the, the assessment we've got here, or to be able to add something else in. So let's say that they believe it's some kind of mechanical back pain, uh, lower back, kind of generic back, lower back pain. They can search for the ICD-10 code that relates to that or add uh, uh, their own assessment as well. Never type in a live demo. Um, and then the final part is being able to export this. So in this case, this is a kind of a standalone version, but you could also imagine this being the kind of complete consultation and being able to port that across to the EHR. Um, this part here is particularly exciting to us in the assessment section, because we're able to track all of the changes that the provider makes during the consultation, and then use the data from this to form an intelligent feedback loop, which we then use to train the models and make them more relevant to the population that, that provider group is serving. Um, so this is a really kind of big step forward for us, not only in terms of the breadth of our product, but also the ability to, to train our AI models and build out a data set which will, which will allow us to, to go on to the next level. Fantastic. Thanks, Tim. That's very exciting to see the, uh, the, the evolution of the, of the product there. So, Peter, the, uh, you know, if you think about the evolution of this technology, obviously you're heading, we're heading you know, from a point where can we replace Google and give, me, give a patient a better idea of what they might be having to now something which is now much more integral into the, to the realm of the, of the clinician, the diagnosis, the visit, all that other stuff. We've heard for a long time about the waste of time, that you know, the amount of time that's spent by clinicians taking patient histories, and sometimes they're split up, and now the patient history is taken by you know, a, a, another provider. There have been some complaints, by the way, that in, in the evolution of telehealth or the vast growth of telehealth during the pandemic, that a lot of the stuff that was done by other professionals is now having to be done by the doctor and the doctor spending longer with telehealth than, 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 than not, you know, back and forth. Just give me a sense from, you know, you've been in this now for, for a decade. What is the sort of willingness and interest of clinical professionals to sort of accept these uh, dynamic patient led, but, you know, AI tools to try to help them figure out where they are? Um, and how much is, is this still a sort of, you're, you're, you're banging your head against the, the resistance of, of clinicians who basically want to, want to manage the whole encounter. Give me a sense of where, where people are, because among other things, you know, the average clinician in the last decade has been beaten up by having to take on the electronic medical record, a lot of which seems to be recording, but not helping this kind of stuff. So just give me a, a sense about where you think the, the medical professional clinicians are. Right. I, I think it's a tough question, but I'll try to share my thoughts. Well, yeah, don't come around here for the easy stuff, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's changing. So back when we started, uh, people really uh, thought that what we have is a sort of science fiction and they completely couldn't get what we do. But things moved on. Uh, a few years ago, this, we've seen this new buzzword, let's say, about machine learning. And somehow this machine learning AI ideas started making their way to healthcare. And since COVID unfortunately happened, I think that served as a big accelerator. 
and I think maybe a test flight for some of those chatbot um, slash triage solutions. Because look at this, before COVID, health systems, cell medicine companies, they were not so keen on testing this out. But once you had one use case focused on COVID only, suddenly it became always a necessity for you to have a tool like that. So we, even with COVID, just uh, this will be long answer, but I'll try to keep it short. So it was so important that we managed to sign a partnership with the Polish Ministry of Health in like one week, just to facilitate the process of triaging patients, uh, which normally would take you forever. So it's changing. I know your question is more about the physician perspective. I think it also improved. Of course, you all still have doctors that are not keen on any sort of technology out there. I think there is a second group that is starting to realize the benefits. But I think the key here is to uh, make sure that uh, you have enough evidence to show them, right? And to gently show that this is your friend, not the threat. Because obviously the purpose of this intake tool is to save you time. In our internal studies, we, sh we saw that we can save about two to three minutes if you have a pre-assessment in place. We don't have enough data on how much we can improve accuracy. This is still something we need to do. And there is like a lot we need to learn, but this time saving, giving this huge burnout. I think if you look into primary care and latest stats in the US, between 40 and 50% of primary care physicians are reporting burnout. So we hope that we'll be able to collect enough evidence to show them that, hey, your life can be a little bit better if you use some help from this AI side and outsource a little bit of work to patient before the visit. So uh, you, you'll, you'll think we're, we're getting there. In that term. And then talk to me next about, and maybe you've done this more in Europe than in the US, but um, the sort of health system integration, because Obviously, it's, it's, it's going to be better if this is a tool integrated into the other stuff they're doing. There's a lot of complaining, obviously, about the use of the EMR. Um, mm. and a lot of people trying to build all different ways around it, including voice, you know, natural um, ambient voice recognition and different ways of input and, and different ways of, of changing it. But nonetheless, the, uh, the, 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 the entry into the EMR has, has been a big problem for for, for many years now, it hasn't really been fixed. So how do you think this fits into that wider ecosystem of tools for clinicians? I think it's a huge problem. I think it's really key and also one of the areas that we're exploring. However, going back to what I mentioned before, I think APIs are here to help you. And with those new EHR, like information exchange standards, it turns out that you don't need to solve every, every problem that exists, but if your API is good enough, you can start uh, assembling the puzzles piece by piece, right? And that's what we also see with our existing partners and clients. In the meantime, I got some uh, PR support from my team. So a uh, good example, aside from Microsoft that we work with, uh, is a recent partnership with, we have with Optin. And it's a, like a very important uh, partnership for us because we didn't have to integrate with any EHRs. We just provided what we have best, which is API for processing your symptoms, risk factors, and they build their own user interface and they're much better with integrating into EMRs. So uh, I think of obviously EMR integration problem exists. But if different systems can talk to each other through APIs in a more or less seamless way, step by step, you can start solving problems. Okay, I think that's, that's, that, that, I, I make sense. Sorry, Tim, you want to jump in? Yeah, I was just going to say, to add on to that, I think the, the second part of it is to make sure we're, we're working with EHRs and providers rather than trying to add in an additional tool. I think that's the key step here is we're not trying to replace an EHR. In some cases, like we'll try and do it as stealthily as possible while still adding value to the to the provider. So I think keeping an open mind there, as Pilt said, having the APIs that we have flexibility in the way that we implement that, uh, but offering the customer the range of different options and picking the right one for the right for their business model and for their set of providers is, is really the key to success there. All right, so uh, two last questions. The first one's on, on the business. Uh, so 
uh, you've got sex to money, you've been building it sort of steadily over the over the years, you've got a lot of different connections, you mentioned 100 customers. What does good look like in uh, in in three to five years? Where, where, where do you think this company will end up? Hmm. Great question, Matt. Uh, I'm sure one of the people who gave you the 30 million asked you something like that. So just repeat <laughs> something it. Something along the lines. No, <laughs> they never ask. No, just, just, just kidding. Uh, so I, I would say uh, this idea of developing a platform is what really matters. So we want to expand from being a symptom checking tool to then covering intake collection then following up after visit, because it's also very important what happens after your visits and in between. So we wanna be the, the most friendly API first and customizable platform, which can be used by our B2B partners to make their processes better in primary care. Also around this, there is a very important idea of automating low acuity diseases, All right? So I'll try to, sketch this idea really gently, but just like we'll have self-driving cars in five to 10 years from now, I really believe there will be space for fully automated bots for very, very low acuity diseases. Think about maybe cold, maybe UTI. And why is that happening? So by 2030, we'll be short of almost 10 million of doctors, nurses, and midwives. So with such huge shortage, and I think there are certain constraints in how fast we can train physicians, those very mild things, I, I believe, should be treated by a triage bot on the front line, sending you to self-care guidelines, if applicable, and of course, escalating to real physician whenever needed. So that's our, let's say, big vision. We, will, we, will, we won't be able to get there tomorrow, but it's more like five to 10 years from now. And in order to do that, you need to have great partners to work with and you, you need to have quality data to train your solutions on. Uh, and you can not build this data set without partnering with some of the best health systems out there. No, I think it's an interesting uh, place to go. Obviously we're, we're seeing a little bit of that starting now on the online pharmacy space in the US, which is uh, starting to get a bit controversial especially in the mental health space, but uh, I could, you know, it, that is something that's clearly going to have to be built in, sort of the self, the self-driving patient, as it were, um, getting to the uh, to, to the meds for all of these these conditions. And I think that there's going to be some regulatory change that has to come with yes. that. But nonetheless, that that, that is yes. definitely a place you said because otherwise we don't have the uh, the, the, the personnel, and, and it's basically a lot of it. If the computer can replace it, is low is low value work from the clinician anyway. All right, my last question, and this is not about you know your business as a whole, but. If I think about it, the people who are doing symptom checker chatbots, we mentioned Babylon, mentioned uh, uh, K-Health from Israel, we mentioned uh, there's the medic tool folks from Spain, there's you from Poland, there's um, I mean, some others from, from uh, there's Ada from Germany. There's a couple, and a giant, which has a German CEO, there's a couple in the US, there's Bui and a couple of others I can think of, but how come that this area of digital health grew up, you know, has so many European competitors compared to you think the rest of digital health kind of starts in the US and, and, and goes outwards. It seems to be the other way around with this sort of symptom checking AI language. Do you have theories for that or is it just random? <laughs> That's a good question. I, I don't have an answer, but uh, I think you have uh, a bunch of really great companies that started out from the US, like Bowie, K-Health, or actually maybe not started in the US, uh, 98.6 health navigator you used to have. Right. So, uh, and to be honest, I think you've got um, a company like that in pretty much every country throughout the world. All right. So, I, so the, I'm making up this European renaissance oh. in, in uh, sort of symptom checking. <laughs> All right. Fair enough. I, I, yeah. I wonder whether there's something in it in terms of the, the models of care. And in the US, oh. there's, there's so much incentive to be, to be close to the to either be close to the pair or be taking on the role of the pair and and innovating in that sense whereas in europe or other markets you, you maybe don't have the option to do that quite so much and therefore you need to to partner partner with the existing providers and pairs and, and provide them with the tools in order to, to do that job so i think there's there's probably something in that in terms of the the b2b versus the direct mm -hmm. consumer and b2c model who, yeah. who knows? We will we will find out um, as things develop. Obviously, this is a fascinating space. There's a lot of room here for a lot of changes, a lot of improvement. And great to hear from uh, Informatica today as to what, why you guys are saying. And congr congratulations on the round and hope things keep building. 
So it's Matthew Oliver, it's with me, Peter Trzaszewski and Tim Price from Informatica, who just uh, celebrated their, who just uh, announced their thirty million dollar round today, and have given me a big rundown as to what the company does. Guys, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for talking with me. Thanks, Matt. Thank you.